Good evening, everybody. Hi, welcome to Soul Food Books tonight. My name is Clint. On behalf of Soul Food, I want to welcome you here, first of all, tonight. We have a tradition of uh, raising good subjects underneath this roof and talking about the things that matter the most and about being uh, good stewards of our planet, about being li alive and awake. And those are the things we, um, we promise to do every day tonight. Uh, it's nice to have you guys here. I feel privileged to have this many awake people here on a gray, rainy, dark Wednesday night. So um, tonight, I want to uh, in introduce to you the leader of our night tonight, Miss Kate, to the stage. I feel like I should be singing a song instead of giving a speech to you guys. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not very musical, <laughs> so I, I won't do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, hello, everyone, um, and welcome to tonight's GE Labeling Campaign Action Meeting. Um, my name is Katie, and I'm the East Side organizer for Food and Water Watch's Let Me Decide campaign to um, make GE Labeling the law. And Food and Water Watch, um, for those who don't know, is a national consumer advocacy organization uh, working to protect our food and water resources from corporate abuses. And I'm so excited to be here in Washington um, to help make us the first state to require the labeling of genetically engineered food. Um, and the work that we're going to be doing this spring uh, wouldn't be possible without the really great foundation that was laid by all of the volunteers and community members who, um, who worked to gather signatures to qualify this initiative, um, GE labeling, to be on the ballot here in Washington. Um, so I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge that accomplishment. So I was wondering if anyone who signed a petition or volunteered to qualify um, I-522 on the ballot, if you could stand up um, or wave a hand. Um, yeah, a lot of you. So thank you guys. Yay. Um, that, that, was <laughs> that was really solid work. And on January 3rd, um, those they delivered over 350,000 petitions to the Secretary of State which is, by the way, over 100,000 more than they needed um, to qualify I-522 for um, the People's Right to Know Genetically Engineered Food Act. Um, so that's really impressive. And Food and Water Watch is really proud to be a coalition partner and ally of Label It Washington. Um, you know, it's we. I wouldn't be here today, and we wouldn't be able to continue doing this work on this campaign um, without them. So um, yeah, again, awesome work, guys. Um, and I think it's important to mention that um, even though it's it's great that Washington has the potential to take the lead on this issue to label genetically engineered foods, um, this campaign is part of a, a national movement, um, I think, to reform our food system. And the work that we're going to be doing locally is really vital to, um, you know, starting this transition towards a more just and sustainable um, and transparent food system in the U.S. Um, so I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, and I know all of you are probably here because you want to help, um, you know, pass this ballot initiative in the fall. And tonight we are going to be talking um, a lot about how we can all work together to make that happen. So let me just quickly go over the agenda for the next hour. Um, first, I'm going to give a quick overview of the campaign and um, Cody Young, the conservation program coordinator for the Washington Sierra Club, is going to talk a little bit about the problems associated with um, genetically engineered foods and um, our food system these days. And then after that, we'll actually spend the bulk of the meeting in, um, you know, we're going to break out into smaller discussion groups um, that are each focused on one different area of the campaign. And we'll brainstorm how we can build the support we need um, to make this campaign really big on the east side. Um, and then at around 7.50, we'll all come back together um, and do a quick report back, um, you know, some highlights and great ideas from each group, and then just wrap up. Um, and at 8 o'clock, we'll have a social right here at Whole, Fo uh, Whole Foods. <laughs> 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 Slip of the tongue. <laughs> um, don't you to get confused. <laughs> um, no, we'll be right here at Soul Food um, for, you know, the next half hour or until Soul Food closes and kicks us out um, to just get to know each other and talk more about the issue. Um, so... That said, I do um, want to talk a little bit more about the issue at hand, um, genetically engineered foods. And GE Foods um, refers to 
these foods, it's, um, it's a process where you take genetic material from one organism and insert it into that of a totally different organism. And usually the point being to um, produce crops that are resistant to pesticides or that are able to produce pesticides internally. So most of these um, GE foods are, um, you know, they're produced by chemical companies um, like Monsanto and, and Dow Chemical so that they can then sell farmers not only the GE seeds but also the chemical fertilizer or uh, pesticides that go along with those seeds. Um, so that is problematic um, for a couple reasons. Um, there are three in particular, um, three reasons why I think we should be really concerned with, with that definition of genetically engineered foods. Um, first of all, so as consumers, um, you know, there are no long-term studies showing that genetically engineered foods are safe for human consumption, um, and yet they've been on the shelves of our grocery stores for 15 years uh, without our knowledge or consent. Um, and second, as inhabitants of the ecosystems that surround us, uh, we should be concerned because of the because of the environmental impacts associated with um, all of the pesticides that GE um, GE crops require. And then third of all, um, you know, we should also be concerned as uh, conscientious community members because of the the impacts that these genetically engineered seeds have on farmers, on small farmers. Um, so now Cody is going to come up and talk a little bit about that um, and his experience farming and working for the Sierra Club. Like she said, I am the conservation program coordinator for the Sierra Club, and public speaking is part of my business, but every time I get on the stage and bite the microphone, I still get butterflies. So <laughs> excuse me if I'm a little nervous. Uh, the other reason I'm up here, though, is not just because I'm an organizer, but because right out of college, I spent a couple of years starting organic farms, and I've actually had the privilege of working on two organic farms that began from the ground up and are still operating now. They're no longer underneath my management. And... I went to farming first because of this notion I have about what really makes a population and a person free. And, and freedom is defined by novelty of choice of action, in my opinion. Novelty of choice of action is fundamentally based on the abundance of resources to make that choice. And so, in my mind, the thing that was that would provide the most stability for a community, that makes the most appropriate change for a community, is to be able to provide that community with local food, to be able to provide the people in that community with jobs operating a farm and local food. But organic farms don't just make the food, they also clean the air, they clean the water. They are more or less reapplying areas for the ecosystem. And so in having local farms, not only do you have to cut back on your transportation costs for the food, you can walk out to the farm and see how your food is being produced because it's local, it's healthier, it tastes better. I don't know when you keep biting on that, it tastes better. <laughs> and, um, and, and it provides local outlets for econo economic, small local economic growth outlets is what it does. And so when I started farming, it was probably the most amazing thing that I had ever been able to do and witness, and it was awesome. We walked out to this field and there was nothing but grass. A few weeks later, we are in the dirt, literally with our hands, planting thousands of tomato plants just down the road. And by the end of that first season, we were able to look back at eight acres that was once grass that had now become food, and enough food to feed hundreds of people within this community. Food that people could, children could come out and look and see where food actually comes from. They can get a little bit of emotional investment in why they eat what they eat. And anyone could come and talk to me about how I was handling their food or what I was doing to it. So that went on for a while, but I began to notice that there were calcium deposits in our water. It got cloudier and cloudier. And about four miles away, there was a, stone, a limestone quarry. And this was Bloomington, Indiana. So Bloomington, Indiana is about this much topsoil, and then the rest of it, limestone. It's basically what we get. So we were lucky to have an organic farm that had enough soil to grow stuff from. But so the calcium deposits kept coming up, and it would get a little bit worse, a little bit worse. And I started talking to the farmer about this, and he was sort of upset because now we had to go and import water to the farm, an extra expense. We actually had to go out, get water, and bring it into the farm 
because the water that was available in our water table was bad for plants. It was no longer useful. And so in looking at that, I realized that really what's happening is like as badly as I want to farm and as badly as I want to take on you know, the, the beautiful responsibility of providing food for individuals, there was a context that did not help that institution thrive. You know, it's the same thing where we go, like, I can ride my bike to work every day, but that doesn't stop uh, oil companies from getting billions of dollars in subsidies. I can go out and I can plaster my own reusable bags to the uh, grocery store every day, but that doesn't stop companies from buying plastic bags. I can go out and I can buy all the organic food I want, and that does help farmers, but that doesn't stop the fact that right next to it, unlabeled, is some manner of organically modified food that takes so many resources and drives work away from these small farmers. And the essence of economic development and economic freedom is information, and that's what we're being denied. And so then what you have is you have all of these things that you do that are individual uh, inclinations. I want to help, so I ride my bike. I want to help farmers, so I buy organic food. But they do not change the social context in which those that habit exists. And so it will always be an uphill battle. So everyone is here tonight because you want to make a certain amount of change. And the thing that I learned that stopped me from farming, which is something I am still absurdly hung up on, to this day I am absurdly hung up on it. But what made me take that move back to organizing, organizing is I realized that the people that are willing to forego one passion for the sake of developing a place where everyone can live out their other passion. I, I have an interest in policy that most people don't share. I have a love of organizing, and that's what I studied when I was in college. As far as I just pl political science and philosophy, but as far as I'm concerned, that's organizing. And I realized that really if I ever wanted to farm, if anyone ever wants to farm, that we need to create a social context in which these positive habits are encouraged and thrive. And so as long as there are companies out there writing policy about organic farming, your soil has to be untouched for seven years if you want an organic certification. If you want to ha raise organic meat on your farm, and we actually went through this on the second farm I helped start, you have to build a building for the FDA to bring a person in to do their work in an outside building on your property that has its own bathroom. And there really is no reason for that other than some lobbyist from Monsanto was like, ah, I don't like farmers and I think we should still corner the market. Let's throw in a bunch of stuff that doesn't make a whole lot of sense just to sort of add insult to injury, make it harder to do this. And uh, so I realized that, you know, with Monsanto owning something like 99% of all the seeds, you know, when we were trying to buy our seeds, we want organic seeds that come from heirloom varieties that farmers have put time and effort into artfully cultivating. There are two places I know to get those seeds. Johnny Seed Catalog and Seed Savers, done. Everything else I know of is generally owned by Monsanto, and that's it. And if you want freedom of resources, abundance of resources for freedoms of choices, then we need more choices. And that's the whole, the other side of this GED problem that we don't ever really talk about is the fact that they are artificially cornering that market by buying up all that food, by taking all those seeds, going to places where farmers have been working on one strain of corn for millions to thousands of years. And then because they have the technology to observe that gene, they say, okay, well, we looked at that. That's ours now. Like, and that kind of stuff just undermines the work that makes farmers want to do that. So um, anyway, that's why I'm here. That's why I came back to the Sierra Club because there are much more pressing issues now than my own little desire to live my little house on the prairie life that I will – get back to someday, but right now there are other things that need to be done, and that is what we're all here to do tonight. So um, I'll be around for most of the time, I think. You know, I don't know if anyone has any questions, if I can take questions, but I feel like, you know, we're all here for the right reasons. We all know why we're here, and that if we don't work to create a social environment that is conducive to positive, sustainable living, all the work we do is never going to be enough, and it will always be an uphill battle. And we're always looking for what's the foundational issue. And that foundational issue is an involved, educated, active community. Once we have that, we can begin to progress the culture forward so that all these habits that we know are positive and useful can start to really grow and thrive without us constantly having to battle against a system that doesn't want that to happen. So that's my little spiel. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But otherwise, I'm going to do the rest of the presentation.
Rachel. Sure. I want to make sure you're in touch with everybody. Yep, else absolutely. I'll be around. Thank you so much for that, Cody. Um, I mean, it just kind of, um, you know, it reminds me that I think taking action on this issue is so important because I think it will help us work work closer towards, um, you know, making the world we actually live in more like the world that we envision. Um, so I, I envision a world where, you know, where our food system um, grows healthy crops and healthy communities um, and where I can go to the grocery store and be ensured that the food um, that I'm picking is naturally produced and a world where I can feed my friends and family with a clear conscience, you know, knowing that I picked the best and healthiest ingredients available, um, because we all deserve to be able to make an informed choice about the food that we're buying. Um, and that's why I'm so excited to be here in Washington, um, working to make DE labeling the law by a popular vote so that, you know, we can make at least our state's world more like the world that we want it to be, and then hopefully that will create a ripple effect. Um, and 2013 is going to be just a huge year for DE labeling. Um, and all eyes are on Washington, you know, the next ground zero in the DE labeling movement after Proposition 37 failed in California. Um, so this is a really exciting opportunity that we have as citizens um, to see this change through and ultimately vote for it um, directly on the ballot on November 6th. And in order to accomplish that, um, you know, we have to recognize that, that this is a great opportunity um, to act and begin to take back some of the control of our, of our food system and take back the right to know what's in our food. Um, so as we're working on this issue um, and organizing, you know, and doing everything we can to make this pass, it's also important to know that um, genetically engineered wheat, genetically engineered apples, and genetically engineered salmon are all being developed right now that would dramatically alter the food system um, here in Washington. You know, those are three like huge um, crops or fish, um, in the case of the DE salmon, that, that are really important to people in Washington. And um, they could come onto our shelves, you know, just like everything else, and we wouldn't even know the difference um, between, you know, DE salmon and, and the normal, you know, wild salmon, although that would have to be labeled so that, you know, we would, we would hopefully be able to make an informed choice. But um, anyways, um, these genetically engineered foods are threatening not only the ecosystems and the communities where they're being produced, they're also threatening our democracy because the corporations that are producing these food um, spend mil have been willing to spend, spend millions of dollars to block these DE labeling initiatives from passing on the ballot or in the legislature in any state where there is a ballot initiative or a law in the works. Um, you know, they, Monsanto spent $40 million in California to mislead voters about Proposition 37, and we know that they'll come here to Washington and try and do the same thing in the fall. So that's why we're organizing early here. Um, we have 10 months until November, and we are going to make the best use of that time to keep informing Washington voters about the importance of their right to know what's in their food and to keep raising the profile of this issue through the media, through endorsements um, from people like Governor Inslee and through coalition building. So that by, you know, by the time the fall rolls around, we'll have built up a firewall of public support that Monsanto can't tear down. And, um, you know, Monsanto may have money, but they don't have rooms full of passionate people like this who are committed to fighting for a fair food system. Um, oh, can, can we hold questions until the end? Sorry, I'm, I'm wrapping it up. I'm almost done. <laughs> um, and so basically we do have a lot of work to do this spring to ensure that come November 6th, 51% or more of Washington voters vote yes on I-522. Um, <laughs> and we have a lot of um, plans uh, in the works, but I'm also part of this meeting is to hear your thoughts and ideas about how we can um, effectively, you know, get the word out about DE labeling and make why it's so important. Um, so we're about to split into um, a couple of different discussion groups about brainstorming about this. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to quickly outline um, the plan that I um, and Food and Water Watch have come up with for the next couple months, which, um, you know, we'll start shaping together um, starting tonight. Um, but basically, we're going to start meeting regularly after this meeting um, as a community. And our first um, big event going forward is 
two weeks from today, we're going to have our statewide day of action where we'll collect photo petitions, which basically are just uh, people um, with pictures of people holding signs um, in support of I-522 or DE Logan. Um, so that's going to be one big event and a great way to generate media because of the strong visuals that will be generating that day. Um, again, it's two weeks from today, um, so look forward for that. And then we'll also be planning a big mid-March event as well as um, several smaller events throughout the next couple months like movie screenings and, um, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't want to steal the thunder of the brainstorm in case we're already talking about this. Um, but, yeah, I mean, um, I think I guess I'm, I'll go ahead and introduce the groups and then people can um, just pick whichever campaign area of focus most interests them. Um, so the four groups that we'll be splitting into are grassroots outreach, which will talk about ways to keep getting the word out um, in the community and how we can generate 1,000 petitions to Governor Inslee or Jane Wilson to put the ballot in order. Um, so grassroots outreach will head that away. Um, the second group is coalition building, which will talk about um, you know different community groups and organizations and farms to connect with. Um, to you know maximize the impact of our work and demonstrate broad-based support for the initiative so coalition building is right over there um, the third group is media which will talk about you know different local news outlets that we could contact about our events and also ways to attract media to the events that we'll be holding and media will be the other person <laughs> figure it out <laughs> and then the last group is events because you know, it's just a, it's a great way to engage people and generate visibility um, through our campaign if we have well-planned and well-attended events um, where they will meet and talk about it. Um, and I guess I, I can um, talk to this. I'll take questions at the end, too. I'm sorry. I, I want to give you guys time to get all your ideas out there. Um, so why don't you, the um, breakout leaders, can stand up and make your way 